Lord, we thank you so much for the gift of your word. Thank you for the richness, the fullness, the divine inspiration of your word. And Lord, as we come to look into this passage, I, I'm very mindful that I am uh, so inadequate to unfold it and explain it. But Lord, you are more than adequate, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would anoint my lips, anoint the words, but equally anoint our hearts, our ears and our minds. That you would speak, that you would share what you want us to hear. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, for those who are visiting us today, we are working through Hebrews. Uh, the end is in sight. We're just finishing chapter 12 today, and there's only one more chapter to go. Uh, so we've made some good progress. And uh, in the early part of this chapter, the writer has been speaking about God's discipline of his children and how there's a, a wholesome and a good purpose for that so that as believers we grow up to maturity and because we have a loving father who does this for us the writer turned at the end of our passage last time in verses 12 to 13 to the action that we need to take in response and in those verses he spoke of strengthening the weak hands and the knees and so as we start today's passage in verse 14 uh, he gives further directions for practical discipleship so starting verse 14 we read pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord looking carefully lest anyone should fall fall short of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble and by this many become defiled lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. And in verse 14, the writer encourages good relationships with both God and man. He says, pursue peace with all people. Not everybody will want peace with us because we serve and we live for Jesus Christ. But so far as it is possible, we should pursue peace with all. It will include our relationships with people generally, most of whom don't know the Lord. Uh, and we shouldn't deliberately cause any offence because that might close their minds to the gospel. The gospel, glorious though it is, is challenging enough on its own without us putting people off coming to Jesus Christ in faith by, by the way that we believe, well, sorry, by the way that we behave. It would also pursue, involve pursuing peace with those within the church, both local and further afield. Many churches are split by gossip, bickering, hard-heartedness, and a host of other wrong attitudes that the enemy uses to disrupt the work of God. And the, word of, the word pursue involves active pursuit. We must proactively seek peace between ourselves and other believers. A united and a godly church is a great witness for Christ, and we must strive to achieve it and keep it. Conversely, a disunited and ungodly church does much to damage our witness and to damage God's reputation in the world. I think we have much to thank God for in this as a church. I think we are united and we have a good peace with it between us, but let's fight to keep it and build on what we already have. But we also read that we are to pursue holiness, which takes us to the relationship we have with God. The, right, remi the writer reminds us that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Some versions speak of sanctification, and that's the progressive growth in holiness, the growth in godliness that leads to holiness. And we are to do that. We are to seek to be growing in our, in our walk with the Lord. 
we are to be set apart from the world in our whole outlook and that will then change the way that we live we were sanctified in a positional sense when we became born again what's now being called for here is the progressive continuous sanctification that helps us in our daily walk with god sanctification is the process holiness is the goal with the glorious end result of seeing the Lord for eternity. Hallelujah. Spurgeon said once that unholy Christians are the plague of the church. And he described four types of people who try to get on without holiness. And I guess we're going to recognise all or some of these as I list them out. The Pharisee who is confident in outward ceremonies instead of true holiness. And we've all seen people like that, haven't we? Then there's the moralist. He feels no need for holiness because his life is so good. Well, in his own eyes, at least. And third, there's the experimentalist. Their entire Christian life is lived inward, never looking to outward conduct, but only to feelings. And fourth, he lists the opinionist. Their Christian life is all about believing the right doctrines and is unconcerned about the way one lives. And surely this reminds us that our doctrine must be sound and biblical, but it must be worked out in the reality of daily life. We need to have good head knowledge, but we also have to good, have good behaviour as we serve Christ. It's not to be merely theory in the head, but it must be expressed in a strong and a living relationship with God that also shines out to the world. And as we've seen the need for peace and holiness, this takes us back to verse 11, where the writer mentions that God's discipline produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And God looks for wholesome fruit in our growth in him as we walk with him day by day. And then in verse 15, he continues the sentence that follows on from what we've just seen. He says, we are to look carefully, which is just one word in Greek, the look carefully. It's the, it's the word from which we get the word overseer. So in other words, he's saying that what we need to have is careful oversight of our lives and our attitudes. So we see again that the Christian life should never be passive, but lived with all due care and attention before God. As the verse proceeds, there is a threefold progression downward if the readers fail to keep on the lookout for their spiritual well-being. And they all start with the word lest. The first stage is lest any one fall short of the grace of God. Falling short here implies a moral separation or a failure on the part of the believer to apprehend or appropriate the grace when something negative occurs in their lives. It's not loss of salvation sp being spoken of here, but of the believer not living his life in the grace that he's received from God. We've been saved by grace, and we mustn't stray into legalism or a works-based attitude to our faith. The failure to appropriate grace is the first step downward, causing a failure to progress upward in our faith. The second stage, again starting with lest, is avoiding any root of bitterness springing up to cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled. A root is the beginning and bitterness is what follows. In the context of negative things coming into our lives, if we don't appropriate God's grace, then we're in danger of letting bitterness take a hold. We must be diligent to keep our attitudes pure, because if bitterness creeps in, we will defile our own faith and that of others. Bitterness so easily brings murmuring in the church, and that spreads discontent, so it's damaging to the health of both individual believers and the church as a whole. A root of this nature is poisonous and must be avoided. The first stage of verse 15, referring to falling short of the grace of God, affects the individual 
This second stage affects others as well. And we should all look, at, look out carefully to our attitudes to, so that not only each one as individuals, but that all of us as a body are kept healthy spiritually. And then the third stage goes further in its decline. And it looks back to the example of Esau, as uh, we see in verses seven, 16 to 17. Esau had two wives and he was profane because the Greek suggests someone who tramples on spiritual things. And the writer also almost, almost, and I think rightly, takes it as read that a fornicator is not acting as God would want. And the Bible teaches in several places that such behaviour is not acceptable for the Christian because it's an obstacle to holy living. Esau, however, is highlighted because he sold his birthright for a single meal of lentil stew. It's a pretty cheap price, isn't it? And we find that account in, in Genesis 25, 29 to 34. Esau was impetuous in that account. He smelled the food and succumbed to his fleshly appetite instead of having his mind uh, set on what was important. In the culture of the day, the birthright was an important privilege and blessing. And by selling his birthright for such a small price shows how little Esau regarded the blessings of God. In the same way, many believers today treat their blessings and privileges, privileges from God very lightly, trying to live as they want, fed by their, their fleshly appetites, whilst claiming also to follow Christ. And the writer is urging the Hebrew believe, the readers here to take their commitment to Christ seriously, despite possible persecution, and we're to do the same. In the Exodus account, it was said that Esau didn't merely sell his birthright, but he despised it. And that's why he's described as a profane person. And there's an interesting insight to the word profane, which I haven't come across before, but historically, a fane was a temple or a shrine. And outside every fane or temple, there was an area of land open to anyone and everyone where people gathered. It, it was an open place without enclosure. And in, and in contrast with that, there was the sacred enclosure of the temple or of the fane itself. Esau had no such sacred enclosure in his life. And in that sense, he was a purely secular man. And the point of this third stage in these verses is that we are to have a sacred enclosure in our lives, that we stay in the presence of the Lord and not stray into the way of the world so that we are profane. Esau later sought to inherit the blessing of his birthright, but it was too late. And may we not be those who sacrifice our spiritual purity or our eternal rewards for the appetite of the moment. Jesus taught that it's folly to gain the world, only to lose your soul. We've looked back to Esau, and now we are to look up. The writer turns attention to the believer's position in Christ, but in two sections. First, he tells us where we have not come to, before moving on to where we have come to. So first, part one is verses 18 to 21. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and burned with, uh, that burn with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. For the Hebrew readers, this was significant because it took them back to the beginning of the Mosaic law, which God gave to Moses at Mount Sinai. By returning to Judaism, the Hebrews would be returning to the system that the writer says they have not come to in Christ. And the context for this account is in Exodus uh, 19 verses 10 to 25 which we looked at when we looked at Exodus some months ago. And as Israel arrived at Mount Sinai 
it was a tangible real mountain. In summary, the situation there on that occasion was as follows. The mountain was fenced off. There was to be no trespassing on pain of death. They were commanded to wash their clothes and abstain from sexual relations. There was thunder, lightning, and a thick cloud. There was the sound of the trumpet calling the nation to meet with God. There was smoke like a furnace and earthquakes. Then the trumpet sounded long until Moses spoke and God himself answered. God spoke to Israel from Sinai, but warned them in every possible way to stay away. The people were terrified, so they asked God not to speak to them directly, but to Moses instead. Even Moses was afraid. We find that quoted in Deuteronomy 9.19. So why would the Hebrews want to go back to a context of terror when instead they could enjoy the place of grace. No one has been able to keep the law except Jesus. So why go back to it when they have the fulfillment of the law in Jesus Christ? For us, perhaps, why go back to religion or to the world when we have such riches in Jesus? And then we see the contrast in verses 22 to 24, showing where we have come to as believers. And he says, but you have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. And here we have our eternal future, starting with the promise of the heavenly Mount Zion and the city of the living God. This is the city in heaven that is destined to be the eternal home of all the redeemed. And Jesus is preparing this home for us as he said he would in John 14, two to three. It's the city of the living God because the living God dwells there. And we will be there too, as believers in, in Jesus Christ. It's also the heavenly Jerusalem, because it's the heavenly place where God is. It's our destiny forever. And it's so much better than Mount Sinai, where there was fear. We have the contrast here of fear or fellowship. The law was on Mount Sinai. The cross was on Mount Zion, where Jerusalem sits. But the writer speaks of a heavenly Mount Zion, reflecting the place of salvation and grace. And just as there was the sound of a trumpet and the voice of God at Mount Sinai, when we are summoned to our heavenly home as the bride of Christ, there'll be a trumpet sound and the shout of the voice of God. And that will be the call of grace, not of the law, hallelujah. And then the writer moves on to set out who will be the occupants of the heavenly city. And there'll be six categories mentioned here. And these occupants are the company that we're gonna be keeping for eternity. These are the people that we will be dwelling with in our eternal home. So you're quite entitled to get excited as you look forward to this. It's, it's, it's actually good news. The first is an innumerable company of angels. We're gonna be dwelling with angels. And these of course are the holy angels, not the fallen angels, who will be dealt with in judgment at the lake of fire. And what a joy it will be to share eternity with these wonderful angels who have been serving God in an unfallen state for millennia. It will be wonderful to have fellowship with these people. And they serve us. Hebrews 1.14 tells us they are all ministering spirits to serve the people of God. And we can see them and have fellowship with them. The second category um, is the, the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. And this is the church of Jesus Christ, you and I, and all other believers. Though, those who have believed for salvation from the beginning of the church until the rapture. This again reflects back to Esau, who as the firstborn despised his position 
and lost it. Unlike Jesus, who is the firstborn of the Father, and who is worthy so that we share in the blessings of his exalted position. I love to mention that they are registered, or if you like, enrolled in heaven. Our names are there, so we've got the official invitation to that wedding feast. We're part of the bride after all. No one will be able to say that we don't have a place reserved for us if we're true believers. And then the third occupant is God himself, the judge of all. And because we are in Christ, we won't be cowering before God as the judge, but we will be able to enjoy his presence as our father. Awesome though that is. Our response though will be worship and not terror. The fourth category of people in heaven will be the spirits of just men made perfect, which is a reference to the Old Testament saints. I think they're probably referred to as spirits here because at the present time, these Old Testament saints are not yet reunited with their bodies. They're now in the presence of God in their spirits, uh, as are the church saints who have died. But uh, the Old Testament saints won't receive their resurrection bodies until after the return of Jesus. The church saints will have their new bodies at the rapture. And the Old Testament saints are made perfect in God's sight because they exercised faith in the Messiah to come. And when Jesus died, their sins were fully cleansed, making their salvation complete. And then the fifth occupant we read of here is Jesus, hallelujah, the mediator of a new covenant. And heaven would be decidedly incomplete without Jesus being there, wouldn't it? The new covenant came into effect by Jesus' own blood, but death couldn't hold him so that he is alive forever. And there are two words for new in Greek. Usually when the New Testament refers to the new covenant, it uses the word that means new in quality or nature. But on this occasion only in Hebrews, the writer uses the other word, new in time. And this new covenant had only recently been made by Jesus' death at the time of writing, emphasizing the fresh and the recent revelation that came through the Messiah. And then the sixth occupant of the city is the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Perhaps you could argue this is an unusual occupant, but it emphasizes that the new covenant was ratified by better blood, that of Jesus himself. We've seen before how everything in the tabernacle was sprinkled with blood to cleanse it. And Jesus' blood is better and has, it, it has eternal effect as he has cleansed us who have believed on his name. He refers to Abel here. Um, and Abel was the first person in the Bible who is recorded to have offered a blood sacrifice. Um, I'm sure he wasn't necessarily the first person to have done it, but the first person to have recorded as having done it. He was also the first person to be sacrificed when Cain killed him. Although I think probably the reference here is to the blood that Abel offered. But whether it's Abel's blood or the blood he offered, Jesus' blood is better and spoke of a much better sacrifice because it was pure and spotless. His blood is the only blood that gives us admission into this heavenly city. And Jesus' blood is said to be still speaking, drawing people to himself. And if you notice, there's one notable omission of the occupants here, and that's the Holy Spirit. But of course, as a member of the Godhead, he must also be present. And bear in mind that in Revelation 22, the Spirit is there saying, come. He must be there to say, come, and he's inviting all those who will respond to the gospel. And given the exalted company that we will forever enjoy in this heavenly city, the writer is urging his readers not to turn away from following Christ and then return to Judaism. They wouldn't lose their place there, but they would lose eternal reward. And the company that we will keep there, we've just looked at for eternity, I think that should excite us. It should spur us on to live wholeheartedly for Jesus while we wait for that, gray, that great day 
but we'll hear that trumpet sound. And then the chapter closes with the fifth and final warning in the letter of Hebrews. And this is a warning against indifference in the light of the better blood of Jesus in a better place. Verses 25 to 29. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace, by which may, we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Back in verse 19, we saw the awesome voice of God at Mount Sinai. We've just seen how that Jesus' blood still speaks. So now the writer instructs the Hebrews to see that they do not refuse him who speaks. And the C there is emphatic. They were to make sure about it. The word for refuse is the same one that he used in verse 19 for entreat when they begged that God wouldn't speak to them again. The Israelites stopped their ears to the voice of God. But the Hebrews and we must not stop our ears to God's voice. The Israelites were disobedient to the law and suffered the judgment of God which led to physical death in the wilderness. How much more would the Hebrew recipients of this letter suffer physical judgment in 70 AD if they reverted to Judaism? Obedience to God's voice is crucial. It was for them and it is for us. Verse 26, God's voice shook the earth when he spoke to Israel at Mount Sinai. But this is symbolic of what will happen in the future. The writers had told the Hebrews to look back to Esau. He told them to look up to the glory of the heavenly city. Now he tells them to look ahead to what God will do. And he quotes Haggai 2 verse 6, which also says that God will once more shake the heaven and the earth. And this shaking will be associated First, and just partially with the second coming of Jesus, but ultimately and more fully at the end of the millennium when God will shake everything and there'll be a new heaven, a new earth. What we see now is temporary and will be shaken. And things seem shaky enough at the moment anyway as that, draw, that day draws nearer. The things of the world to be shaken will be removed. And that shows us the folly of putting any trust in our possessions or our career or our health or anything else that's temporary. What will be left is that which cannot be shaken. And the holy city that we have been looking at is unshakable. Our salvation in Christ is unshakable because Jesus Christ cannot be shaken. His kingdom cannot be shaken. So we can have firm confidence in the fact that Jesus will reign on this earth with full authority and power, tempered by his love. Hallelujah. In Jesus, we have stability in an unstable world, so we have no need to fear. Life, when this letter was written, was turbulent, so it would have given great encouragement to the Hebrew believers. And we can draw the same encouragement for the turbulent and changing world that we live in. And then we get the conclusion drawn in verse 28. Since or because we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace. And in contrast to the instability of this world, we have the kingdom of Jesus that cannot be shaken. The Hebrews were feeling the pressure of persecution for their faith. Uh, or alternatively, they, they, they were tempted to get, return to Judaism. But this is a time for them and for us to appropriate grace and not return to the law. 
For grace is not an end in itself, but a means by which we serve God acceptably uh, and uh, with reverence and, and godly fear. For the Hebrews, the, the, the sacrifices in the temple were no longer an acceptable way of appropriating grace or serving God because the, the sacrifices were no longer needed. Equally, in our day, our service for God should be grace-filled and with due reverence for God. It's a huge privilege to be able to serve God, the one who needs nothing but out of his love and grace has chosen that we can and should serve him on this, on this earth. God doesn't need our help, but he's chosen to use us and that's such grace. Our service for him is before his sight. So it's no wonder that it should be with reverence and godly fear. There are eternal issues at stake in our service, so we shouldn't be sloppy about it either. There's also the aspect that we should serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, because in that way, we will gain greater reward in heaven. And with God as a consuming fire, the works of the flesh will be burnt up when he judges our works, so that what is left will be what was done by the Spirit for God's glory. If we don't appropriate grace through Jesus, then the alternative is judgment from God. And we're reminded of that in the last verse, 29. Our God is a consuming fire. And that's a quote from De Deuteronomy 4, 24. God's holiness and justice mean that he must judge sin that has not been dealt with but in faith by the, by the blood of Jesus and in, in his resurrection. For the Hebrews, if they returned to Judaism, they would face the fire of God's judgment on Jerusalem in 70 AD because they wouldn't escape with the believers who were warned to do so by Jesus himself. We have that as a picture of our salvation. We cannot trust in religion or anything else. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can rescue us from the fire of God's judgment that will come upon the unbeliever. It's not harsh of God because his holiness demands it, but his love has given us a way of rescue and it's given a way of salvation to all who will receive it. So what are you hoping and trusting in? If it's not in Jesus, it will be shaken and it will fail. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this passage. Thank you for that uh, command that we should live uprightly in holiness before man and before you. Thank you for that insight into the, the glorious company that we'll keep in that eternal city. Lord, there is so much to look forward to there. But Lord, help us also to guard against the indifference that is warned of here. Help us to live fervently for you, uh, excited that, at the privilege of being able to, to know you, to serve you, to live for you and with you. Lord, help us, we pray. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit and send us out into this, this week with a new determination to live for you in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.